Hello and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And today's podcast is brought to you by Indiana University Press. Their Life of the Past series is lavishly illustrated and meticulously documented to showcase the latest findings and most compelling interpretations in the ever-changing field of paleontology. Find their books at iupress.indiana.edu. In episode 218, we have a bunch of dinosaur news, including dinosaur footprints, dinosaur vision, dinosaur extinction, and dinosaur pirates. Ooh. (laughs) We also have a review of Dinosaurs Are People 2, the mobile game, and we have Dinosaur of the Day, Mononychus, which we usually say Mononychus. So that might be confusing, but we'll try to say Mononychus since apparently that's what most people say. But before we get into all that, we want to thank some of our patrons for helping us to keep our podcast running. And this week we would like to thank Scotty, Megan Dixon, Kessler, Tristan Jules, Grandpa Dino, Rhinosaurus, Morgan Eklove, Dr. Eigenbot, Lori, Risa, Kelly, Manda, Laurasaurus, Timmy, and James Pasco. Yeah, thank you so much. We really appreciate all your support. And our Discord server is growing, so come and join the conversation. It's a good place to discuss news about dinosaurs or dis- dinosaur discoveries. You can also ask questions, talk to your fellow dinosaur enthusiasts. I'm in there quite a bit answering questions and discussing things too. So head over to our Discord server. And if you're in our Patreon, I did a post on how to join it. So hopefully it, that's easy to follow because it's not super intuitive. You basically just link your Patreon account to a Discord account and it'll automatically add you into the server and give you access to everything. Jumping into the news, our first article that we're going to discuss is sort of challenging the long-held attribution of the U. Brontes giganteus print to Dilophosaurus or another similar carnivorous theropod. So Robert E. Weems wrote in Ichnos an article all about this, and it's just the one author. So I'm not sure how many people are on board with this so far. Enough people are that it got through peer review, obviously, and it's published in Ichnos, which I think is a pretty prestigious journal in terms of ichnology, which is things like dinosaur tracks and coprolite and all that stuff. But it's definitely controversial because a lot of people have been attributing these footprints to Dilophosaurus or some other theropod for a long time. But What they say in the abstract is, quote, if the U. Brontes track maker was a theropod, it created the most abundant large tracks found in the Connecticut Valley, Hartford, and Deerfield basins, and yet, for unknown reasons, left no skeletal remains there at all, end quote. Weird. (laughs) Exactly. So he's basically saying, why would there be all these footprints from a dinosaur? And we find other dinosaurs there but never the one that we're saying made all of these footprints all over the place. It's a good question. It's obviously possible because fossil records are incredibly fragmentary, which is always a good starting point. You don't want to make assumptions that just because you haven't found a dinosaur there, some other dinosaur couldn't have left that track. But if there's another explanation that's a little more parsimonious or kind of explains it without having to make the assumption that something made these tracks all over the place that we've never seen there, that might be a better answer. The reason I find this so interesting, though, is U. Brontes is such a ubiquitous fossil in that area that it's the state fossil of both Massachusetts and Connecticut because it's like if you go out and you find a footprint, the odds are pretty good that it's a U. Brontes track. And Dilophosaurus is also the state dinosaur of Connecticut because, in large part, of this... <laughs> series of tracks. So it's possible that Connecticut has chosen the wrong state dinosaur Uh if it turns out that Ubrantes is from a different dinosaur. (laughs) So the authors go on to say, quote, the cursorial bipedal functionally tridactyl prosauropod Anchisaurus, which left two-thirds of the skeletal remains found in these same basins for unknown reasons, left no tracks there at all, end quote. (laughs) It's a little bit of a trolley statement. Yeah. <laughs> like you've got a track maker, supposedly Dilophosaurus, that made all these tracks, 
but you can't find any Dilophosaurus bones. And then you've got something called Anchisaurus, which is a prosauropod, where we find the remains all over the place, but we haven't attributed any tracks to Anchisaurus. So you can kind of see where he's going with this <laughs> beginning piece of data. So he proposes a few reasons why it could be Anchisaurus or some similar prosauropod that left these tracks instead of a theropod like Dilophosaurus. He says that the tracks are from the early Jurassic, when prosauropods were really common in the area, obviously. The tracks are the right size for a prosauropod, which is very important. The tracks come in groups, which kind of indicate herding. They're in a similar sort of fashion where we see later sauropod tracks headed in the same direction, and people say, oh, this is evidence that those sauropods were moving together. And I think that's a little bit weaker piece of evidence because it could just be a group of theropods. You see that kind of thing with theropods once in a while too. Or it could just be that they're all walking in the same direction over the course of a couple of weeks. Doesn't necessarily mean they were all moving at the exact same time. But, you know, could be a piece of evidence depending on how you interpret it. And the last one is that recent Ubrantes tracks show a hallux, which is one of the toes, pointed in the direction that one would expect for a prosauropod. That's probably the best piece of evidence if you can see this toe. The hallux doesn't usually touch the ground so much in a lot of dinosaurs, but every once in a while it does. And if you get a nice track that has it there and it's pointed in a direction where you don't think a therapod would have it, uh-oh, <laughs> might not be a therapod. <laughs> so I really want to see some more opinions on this. I'll try to remember to ask the next ichnologist we talk to about it. But the paper only has 42 views as of this recording, and I don't see any opinions on it at all anywhere else. So It's also pretty new. It is, but hopefully people start talking about it. It seems really controversial to me. I was surprised that there weren't a bunch of like corresponding news articles discussing this, but I guess footprints aren't as exciting as bones, so maybe it's... Technology tends to not get as much coverage. Yeah, I think a lot of people look at the you know, nature communications or nature and PLOS and things like that for the big news stories. And the one that's specifically technology, like you say, might get ignored. But if nothing else, I think it's a really good reminder that even though a theropod means beast foot, and we think of that sort of traditional three-toed print, sauropod means lizard foot. And if you've ever looked at a lizard foot, they're pretty similar <laughs> to theropod beast foot type prints. And sauropods, especially prosauropods, still had big toes and big claws. So the tracks aren't as simple as they may seem. Nothing ever is. <laughs> and up next, now that we've talked about feet, we can talk about eyeballs. So <laughs> there's an article in Nature Communications by Cynthia Tidor and Dan Eric Nilsson. And they were looking at how birds might have used UV light vision to sort of aid in interpreting their environment. So we've talked about this before. Basically, humans, we have three types of cones in our eyes, but birds have four types of cones. And because of that, birds can see in the UV spectrum. They're tetrachromats, and that's pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. I really wish I could see UV light. It would be pretty handy for not getting sunburnt, specifically. <laughs> oh, I see. I was thinking things would look prettier. Maybe. I mean, I don't know. I guess birds would look prettier because birds often have coloration that can only be seen in the UV spectrum. But that's probably not the origin for why birds can see UV light. It'd be kind of weird if an animal started decorating itself in a coloration, waiting for something to evolve the vision or vice versa. It's, it doesn't seem like a very causative effect. Right. Bees can also see UV light. Yeah. And bees apparently use it for navigation which makes sense. You know, if you know where the sun is, that's helpful in sort of getting around, which might have been one of the reasons dinosaurs had it. It could have been useful for navigation. But the researchers took a really interesting approach. They basically went into a forest with a camera that could shoot in UV as well as regular visual light that we're all used to seeing. And what they found was really interesting. So if they shot a scene that to us basically just looks like a wall of green. That's what fizz.org called it. <laughs> the dinosaurs could see a little more three-dimensional structure to it. And the reason they could do that is because of the way that UV light 
reflects and passes through or doesn't pass through leaves in a way that's different than regular visible light. So basically, UV doesn't reflect off the ground as much as light that's visible to us. So when we look at a scene that's sort of shaded a little bit, everything kind of has a similar brightness because the light is bouncing around off everything and there's not a lot of distinct shadows and all that kind of stuff. But with UV light, it's a lot more sensitive to where the light is actually shining because it doesn't bounce off the ground and give as much of a reflection and sort of indirect light from below. On top of that, UV light doesn't shine through leaves the way that visible light does. If you've ever gone underneath a tree and looked up at it, sometimes you see that really pretty green color that you get where it's sort of the visible light shining through the leaves. I really like that look. But UV light doesn't really do that. It kind of gets stuck in the leaf or bounces off. And because of that, in the UV spectrum, the top and the bottom of a leaf look a lot more different, <laughs> for lack of a better expression, than they do in visible light. So you can really tell the difference of the top of a leaf versus the bottom of a leaf if you're looking at it using UV spectrum. All of that combines to mean that if a bird is looking at a whole bunch of leaves, they can kind of detect which parts of the leaf are facing up versus not facing up, and they get a better three-dimensional view of a forest. They propose a couple ways that this might be useful. They say that it might help them navigate, like what Sabrina was saying, like how bees do. It could have helped them sort of move around specifically in the environment because if when you're farther away, you can sort of see a path through the leaves because it doesn't just look like a wall of leaves and you can see a little more structure to it. That could be helpful. And then it could also help them find food potentially because if you think about it, if the top of the leaf is really reflective of UV light, but there's something sitting on it, maybe now that stands out a little bit more than it would otherwise. So I think that's pretty awesome. And I really wonder if all dinosaurs had this ability or if just some dinosaurs had the ability. And it makes me think maybe predators could have used it to pick out green dinosaurs or other animals from the plants, depending on what kind of like UV reflectance they have. And maybe dinosaurs had to have a sort of UV camouflage <laughs> or maybe some other animals do too. That would be kind of interesting if we looked at a forest and started checking out other animals to see what kind of UV reflectance they have. Maybe they try to simulate leaves even in the UV spectrum. And the authors encourage that other people should go out in the field and try using these UV cameras and sort of doing more in the field work rather than just sort of assuming that UV light behaves similarly to visible light, sort of see how it actually happens. Basically, go watch birds. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Maybe other animals, I don't know. <laughs> and another really interesting article that came out this week goes in a completely different direction, but still dinosaurs related. And it's all about the frequency of quote-unquote small body collisions with the moon and earth. And in this case, small body means things like comets, asteroids, and meteors. So not really small <laughs> on a human scale, but small on like a planetary scale. Sort of like, you know, recent in geological time is different than recent in human scale time. But what Christian Koberl wrote about in science, you could use this thing called the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter to estimate the age of craters. And basically it works by measuring the rock ejecta, which is caused by the initial impact that created the crater. And when you look at the sort of map of little rocks and debris around a crater, the more ejecta that's still next to the crater, the more recent the crater was formed. Because even on the moon, there is still some erosion. It's way smaller than it is on Earth, obviously. But these small rocks do eventually move away or get buried by dust or break down a little bit. So over time, there's less rock ejecta that's obvious right next to the crater. And of most interest to us are the six mile or 10 kilometer and up impactors, because that's what we estimate the Chicxulub impactor was sort of in the 10 to 15 kilometer range. So long story short, since this isn't a space podcast, <laughs> they didn't see as many craters in the 290 million year to more recent range as they did in the 290 million year to further in the past range. And for the most part, 
other news media picked this up as, you know, dinosaurs were doomed. There were more impacts hitting at that time. And it was like all in the cards and like we should have predicted this or they should have predicted this if they had astronomy. But really the frequency of the impacts was only about two and a half times more frequent than it was in that pre-290 million year period, according to their analysis. But the unfortunate thing about their analysis is it doesn't include anything older than about a billion years. So really we're just saying that in this one billion year time frame, it looks like the most recent third had a little bit more impact events than the earlier two thirds. That it's not necessarily the full story. Right. Yeah, exactly, because the Earth has been around for way longer than a billion years. But to me, even if this is exactly right, and that at this 290 million year-ish range, impactors started increasing in frequency, it doesn't really mean much of anything about dinosaurs, because it still took another 230 million years <laughs> before the dinosaurs were wiped out. So if we're going to look at it that way, the story could be just as easily portrayed as like, we right now are in a period of increased impactor activity because we're a lot closer to that impactor event than the dinosaur extinction is to that slight increase in events. But I think most people would look at that and be like, eh, really, I don't see meteors all the time. How frequent is it really? <laughs> so instead they make it about dinosaurs. And apparently some astronomers have already kind of disagreed with this notion because there's competing evidence on Earth as well. Back to some modern time news. We got a quick update on Bears Ears National Monument in Utah. I think we've talked about this before, the fact that SVP and others are suing and arguing that the 1906 Antiquities Act, which was used to create Bears Ears, quote, only allows presidents to establish monuments, not to drastically reduce them, end quote. And this is according to Science Mag. So the case will be heard in Washington, D.C. instead of Utah. They're now waiting for District Judge Tanya Chutkin's decision about the Department of Justice's request to dismiss the lawsuit. And in the meantime, paleontologists who were granted federal funding prior are working to finish up their excavations and research. And SVP is also hoping that the Bureau of Land Management, BLM, will, quote, treat now unprotected areas as though they still had monument protection giving priority to science and conservation, end quote. There's an emphasis right now on using it for multiple uses, and that includes mining, grazing, cross-country trekking by off-road vehicles, as well as paleontology. Yeah, this case just keeps going. I don't, uh, we first heard about it like two years ago now, and I don't think anything has actually started on this land, probably because of these lawsuits. Probably. It'll be interesting to see how it gets interpreted, though. Yeah, I'm sure it'll set some precedents, too. So we will keep following the story and let you know. In DeKalb, Illinois, a woman named Dolores Graves has a 230-pound Paris Rolophus statue in her yard, and she's named the dinosaur Paris. Paris is made of resin, it's yellow with some speckles, and she bought Paris last summer. A month later, Paris laid an egg and by that, it means a, a large white mushroom grew under the statue and looked like an egg. Well, that's funny. <laughs> yeah. So Dolores and her family used to go fossil hunting when she was a kid, which kind of started it. And I noticed on our Facebook when we posted about this, we got a few comments. And Dolores is not the only person with a dinosaur in her yard. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks for the pictures. <laughs> <laughs> we got to get some dinosaurs in our yard. Can we get them to lay eggs? Maybe. <laughs> I don't know if it's damp enough here. I'm not sure how many mushrooms we could grow. Yeah, maybe. Next, the Japanese manga series One Piece has a story arc with a group of dinosaur pirates. So in the story, the bad guys are pirates. Although, so I haven't read the manga series, but reading about it, it sounds like the good guys were also pirates. <laughs> Anyway, one of these pirates is known as Page One. He can turn into a Spinosaurus with his dragon dragon fruit. That's the key, <laughs> is the, the type of fruit you eat. And another pirate, x can turn into an Allosaurus. So this manga series started in 1997, and it's been adapted for anime. I might have to look more into it. Very curious. Nice. I wonder if that'll be like the new thing, because it used to be pirates versus ninjas. It's going to be pirates versus dinosaurs now. Yeah, pirates are very popular. And you can make dinosaurs work with almost anything. True. And next, thanks to Ryan who shared this with us a while back, but it took me a long time to get around to trying. 
There's a mobile game by Pamela Games called Dinosaurs Are People 2, and it's also known as Dino People <laughs> for short. It's a freemium game. The description is, quote, when dinosaurs came out of their caves, they found a little world all of their own. They learned how to farm and how to mine. They worked, they built, they dreamt of bigger things, end quote. It's a pretty fun game. It's actually very easy to play without spending any money, but it does take time. The good news is the game keeps going when you are not playing, so you can come back an hour later or, you know, maybe play right before bed, and then when you wake up, check on it for a couple minutes. Yeah, it seems like how a lot of the older freemium games were, and then you pay in if you want it to speed up, right? Yeah. So the gist of the game is you have your own planet. It's probably Earth or something Earth-like. It's a very small planet. It only holds <laughs> like five buildings <laughs> and a bunch of dinosaurs. You have to build a world for your dinosaurs and also collect the dinosaurs. There's 10 dinosaurs in the game. Velociraptors, Stegosaurus, Triceratops, Tyrannosaurus, Brachiosaurus, Parasaurolophus, Spinosaurus, Diplodocus, Pachycephalosaurus. They all act like people, hence dino people. And you upgrade in the game to move through different periods of, I'm going to call it human time, because you start, for example, in the ancient age all your dinosaurs, actually, they start wearing no clothes and then you can upgrade where they discover clothing and all of a sudden they're in like caveman clothes. And then every time you upgrade again, the, the clothes change as well as one of the buildings that represents where the dinosaurs live because <laughs> they all live together peacefully. Don't they all live in like the same house? Yeah. <laughs> well, it starts as a cave and then it turns into a house. Oh, gotcha. And then I don't know, I haven't finished the game, so I don't know what it will become in the end, but... There's the Middle Ages, the Industrial Age, the Modern Age, Space Age, and Future Age. You're in the middle one right now, right? The Industrial Age? So I'm, I just got into the Modern Age. Oh. Yeah. So you build different factories or farms throughout the ages. There's a carrot farm, ore mine, cookie factory, bolt building, and powerhouse for electricity, and an IT office. Early on in the game, you can barter for things, like trade in ore for carrots, upgrade, all that stuff. But then at some point in the game, in the in industrial age, everything becomes money, which is what I just got into. And that's oh. how I got into the modern age. So you don't have to worry about the different units anymore? It's all just money? It's all just money, yeah. Oh. So there's not too much to the game. You rack up various points, whether or not you're playing, like I said, and then when you return, you can watch an ad to double your points. So <laughs> it's really easy. Uh, yeah, I've just been playing a few minutes a day. You can also take pictures of your dinosaurs and share them. That's just for fun. It's kind of fun to see them change clothing. <laughs> They also change posture a little bit. I noticed that Diplodocus used to be standing upright, but now that it's in the modern age, it's got its head buried in a book. <laughs> <laughs> At first I thought you were going to say that they made them more like realistic, like the interpretations changed along with human perception. No, no. That would have been a cool touch. They all look the same. It's the clothing that changes and their behavior, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> It's interesting. It's almost more like a anthropology game than a dinosaur game if it's going through, like you said, human time yeah. and all these things are related to human history. <laughs> right. You can add dinosaurs to anything. <laughs> like I said, oh, every once in a while, too, a UFO flies around your planet. If you tap it, it explodes and gives you resources. So that's nice. Also helps you speed up the game. There's an option you can reset your progress periodically with fossil fuels. Like when you reach a certain milestone, you tap this meteor icon and destroy your civilization and start over, but then all your buildings get an extra boost so you can huh. work back up to whatever age you were pretty quickly. I tried it. The first time was really difficult because it was like, oh, now I got to start all over, but I ended up doing that a few times and now I have like a 10 time boost. So it takes you all the way back to the cave? Yeah, and then you have to start collecting your dinosaurs again. The downside is you collect the dinosaurs, but there's no, it's all random which ones you get. So the first time I went through, I got all 10 dinosaurs, but now I'm in the modern age and I'm still missing Tyrannosaurus. Oh, yeah. how do you find the dinosaurs? Well, until you get to the money system, you have to collect a certain number of points by tapping or the dinosaurs generate it for you. And then now I just need money. So you like buy the dinosaurs basically? Yeah. But not with real money, with the games. So I'm at 10x now. I probably won't do it again, especially <laughs> once I get my Tyrannosaurus. <laughs> yeah. Every time I've seen you play it, it's basically been you trying to tap on UFOs and waiting for resources to come in. Yeah, it doesn't. 
You really don't need to play more than a few minutes a day. It doesn't seem like the most compelling of gameplay. <laughs> it's cute, though. It's fun to check on from time to time. Oh, also, I read that once you get to the modern age, you invent the rocket and can move to the moon. Yeah. So I don't have enough money to do that yet because there's different goals within each age. That could be kind of cool, a little moon base, dinosaur yeah. moon base. Yeah. I don't really know what happens at the end of the game because it seems like there is an end point. I guess we'll we'll touch back when you finish it. <laughs> <laughs> if it's exciting. If not, maybe not. <laughs> so if you don't hear anything, that means it was a bummer. <laughs> I wonder if once you go to the moon base, if you could hit the Earth with a comet and then recolonize from the moon. It does say in the mission, rocket to the moon or something and save yourself from an asteroid. Uh, so maybe. So I don't know. Yeah. That'd be fancy. It's a whole nother level of complexity. But if we don't mention that, that means that's not how it works. <laughs> <laughs> or we forgot. Yeah. Or the... Before we get into our dinosaur of the day, we have a word from our sponsor, Indiana University Press. As Garrett mentioned, they have the Life of the Past series, and we like to highlight a book from the series every week. So this week, we'll talk about The Bare Bones, an unconventional evolutionary history of the skeleton. What can we learn about the evolution of jaws from a pair of scissors? How does the flight of a tennis ball help explain how fish overcome drag? What do a spacesuit and a chicken egg have in common? Highlighting the fascinating twists and turns of evolution across more than 540 million years, paleobiologist Matthew Bonin uses everyday objects to explain the emergence and adaptation of the vertebrate skeleton. What can camera lenses tell us about the eyes of marine reptiles? How does understanding what prevents a coffee mug from spilling help us understand the posture of dinosaurs? The answers to these and other intriguing questions illustrate how scientists have pieced together the history of vertebrates from their bare bones. With its engaging and informative text, plus more than 200 illustrative diagrams created by the author, The Bare Bones is an unconventional and reader-friendly introduction to the skeleton as an evolving machine. Sounds like an awesome book. There are so many connections between all sorts of modern animals and extinct animals, and when you can piece together which groups they're in, you can learn so much about them. And then, like we always talk about, like, oh, this muscle attachment's a little bit bigger. That means it had a bigger, stronger tail mm -hmm. and all sorts of really interesting details like that. So I want to get this book. Well, you can get that book <laughs> and other books in the Life of the Past series at iupress.indiana.edu. And now for our dinosaur of the day, Mononychus, which... Garrett mentioned earlier we have been pronouncing Mononychus for a while, but apparently more people pronounce it as Mononychus. Yeah, it looks like Mononychus when you read it because there's a Y before the cuss. It was a request from Dinosaur 4602, so thanks. Mononychus was an alvarosaurid that lived in the late Cretaceous in what is now Mongolia in the Nemec Formation. It was small, about 3.3 feet or 1 meters long, and it had long skinny legs. Mononychus was bipedal and could probably run fast. It lived in open floodplains. And it had large eyes, so it may have hunted at night when it was less risky and also cooler outside. Mononychus had a small skull and small pointed teeth, as well as stubby forearms and one long claw on each arm that was about three inches or seven and a half centimeters long. Can't really overstate how weird its stubby arms and huge claws are. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like you look at it and you're like, something is missing from this animal, and it is the arms. Right. But it still has huge claws, at least two of them. <laughs> well, so it's not clear why its arms were this way. It's possible it used the claws to break open termite mounds or get to ants. So, yeah, probably ate insects, maybe some small animals like lizards and mammals. It's been speculated that Mononychus could have also used its claws to dig burrows or dig into nests or catch prey. But in 2005, Phil Center found that no, Mononychus couldn't have used its forearms to grasp prey or dig burrows, but used instead for, quote, scratch digging or hook and pull movements, such as are used by extant anteaters and pangolins to open tough insect nests. Mononychus likely occupied a niche equivalent to that of an anteater or pangolin, an unusual niche for a dinosaur, end quote. It kind of makes sense considering those are the main animals we see now with just huge disproportionate claws to the rest of their body. <laughs> right. It's hard to break into those termite nests, apparently. Yeah, termites have had a long time to figure that out. Mm -hmm. Although less time when Mononychus was around, I guess. <laughs> yeah, that's true. 
It's the arms race. <laughs> Malanikas was named in 1993 by Pearl, Norrell, Chappie, and Clark. It was originally named Mananikas, but spelled differently, <laughs> M-O-N-O-N-Y-C-H-U-S instead of M-O-N-O-N-Y-K-U-S. So only the C-H changed to a K is what happened there. Yes. But it was renamed later. So it was originally named that in 1993, but then later in the year, same year, it became Mananikas with the K because Mananikas with C-H was already the name of a beetle. What if Mononicus ate Mononicus? Oh, that'd be weird. The type species is Mononicus olecranus, and the name means one claw, and the species name means elbow head. <laughs> Mononicus is only known from the holotype that includes part of the skull, vertebrae, all four limbs, thoracic girdle, which connects the arms on each side, and parts of the ilium and pubis. The holotype was found in the 1987 Soviet Mongolian Paleontological Expedition by Namsare, a preparator at the Mongolian Museum of Natural History. Nice. Yeah. Originally, Mononicus was thought to be a primitive bird. It had a ridge that ran down its sternum, like in modern birds, but a bird that couldn't fly. It also had fused wrist bones, like modern birds. Other specimens had been referred to Mononicus. These specimens had partial tails and complete skulls, but those were later found to be Shuvuya, Many Mononicus reconstructions are actually based on Shavuya instead. In the original description of Mononicus, a specimen that had been found during one of Roy Chapman Andrews' expeditions, which is housed at the American Museum of Natural History, was thought to also be Mononicus. But based on other specimens being referred to Shavuya, and the fact that Mononicus came from the Nemet Formation and this specimen came from an older formation, the Jadoka Formation, it's probably not Mononicus. Mononicus is often depicted as having feathers, but the feathers have been found on the Shavuya specimens. Makes sense. If they're close relatives, it probably did. Mm -hmm. You can see Mononicus in Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom in the Lockwood Estate Museum. It's also in Jurassic Park 3 Park Builder, though it's known as its original name, Mononicus, but with the <laughs> CH. And our fun fact of the day is that dinosaurs formed in their eggs in a very similar way to how humans form in the womb. Hmm. Yeah, so we get a pretty strange view of dinosaur eggs, since most of us only see the unfertilized variety, and I'm speaking of chicken eggs, especially, I would say, hard-boiled eggs, because they sort of give you the structure a little bit better. But put simply, I'm just kind of summarizing a whole field of biological research probably hundreds of people have spent their lifetimes researching <laughs> into a paragraph. But when eggs get fertilized, an amnion, it's called, forms next to the yolk. And the amnion is where the actual embryo of the dinosaur forms. And then there's a membrane that forms around the two. So that's sort of in the center of the egg. And it's actually held in place by little cords. It's kind of interesting. You can see it when you crack eggs. But a membrane called the chorion surrounds the yolk and the amnion. So that's what separates the yolk and amnion, where the embryo is, from the rest of the egg, which is basically the albumin. The amnion is connected directly to the yolk so that the embryo can get its nutrients that way. But since it's inside that extra layer of the chorion, it's not connected directly to the albumin. So it's not like I always imagined as a kid that there was like this little chicken that just grew in between the yolk and the albumin or maybe in the middle of the yolk and ate up all of the yolk first and then started eating up the albumin. That's not really how it works. It's in this little thing that contains the yolk and then it has to connect separately to the albumin. I specify that because of how it relates to mammals and other placentals. Is it like the umbilical cord? Yes. <laughs> Spoiler alert. <laughs> <laughs> so the dinosaur absorbs the albumin through something called the allentuis, which connects the amnion to the albumin. And this basic structure is true for all amniotes. So that includes every tetrapod, including dinosaurs, pterosaurs, plesiosaurs, all the other marine reptiles, mammals, and then modern reptiles too, crocodilians, everything. They all us tetrapods have this exact same sort of formation with the exception of how placentals make some changes. So in our bodies, obviously we don't need an eggshell anymore because the mom protects the embryo. 
And then the mom also takes the place of the albumen from sort of the embryo's perspective. So rather than the amnion attaching to the albumen, the amnion attaches to the placenta, which is connected to the mom. Or in scientific terms, the allantois and the yolk become the umbilical cord because we don't need the yolk anymore either. But it kind of explains how animals can go back and forth because we know that viviparity or the sort of internal development of an embryo evolves multiple times, especially in aquatic animals, because it's, it's such a similar structure. So it can kind of switch back and forth if it needs to. It's pretty neat. As a result, you know, dinosaur embryos look a lot like human embryos too. Just when they get a little bit older, you start to see some pretty major differences. <laughs> cool. And that wraps up this episode of I Know Dino. Thanks for listening. If you're a patron, feel free to reach out to us on our new Discord app and become a patron if you're not at patreon.com slash I Know Dino. You can also see us on all the social media channels, Instagram, Facebook. We've got videos on YouTube, all that good stuff. Thanks again, and until next time. Good day.